Weeks have passed and the world is still reeling from the unprecedented assault by Hamas gunmen on the 7th of October 2023 and the subsequent retaliatory strikes by Israel and land invasion into the Gaza Strip. An atomic clock is ticking over the Holy Land. Is there any way to silence it? Can diplomacy hold the countdown? Or is it already too late? The Middle East is on fire and all eyes are on Israel. On the 7th of October, the militant Palestinian group Hamas launched a deadly attack against Israel. Over 5,000 rockets have been fired into Israel from Gaza. Hundreds of Hamas terrorists invaded Israel. At least 1,400 Israelis have been killed and more than 3,000 injured by Hamas terrorist attacks. Over 200 people, including 20 children, were taken hostage by Hamas. Some of the atrocities committed during the raid were unimaginably barbaric and have shocked the civilized world. In response, Israeli jet fighters have hit thousands of targets in Gaza. Many thousands of Palestinians have been killed and wounded in Gaza since Israel launched retaliatory airstrikes, with over a million residents displaced. Gaza is under siege. Electricity, water, fuel and medicine have been cut off. And the siege will continue until the hostages taken from Israel to Gaza by Hamas gunmen have been released. This is without question the most difficult hostage situation Israel has ever faced in its history. But Israel has well-proven expertise in hostage rescue, which it trains for intensively. Set up in 1957, its secretive Sayeret Matkal unit shot to fame in 1976 with the raid on Entebbe, where its commandos rescued hostages from a hijacked plane at a Ugandan airport. The commander of that unit was Jonathan Netanyahu, the only fatality amongst the Israeli commandos. Today, his brother Benjamin is Israel's prime minister, and it is with him that the decision rests as to how the latest hostage rescue mission proceeds. Join me as we relive the Entebbe hostage rescue and consider the present Middle East firestorm that is unfolding before us right now and seek a lasting solution to this seemingly endless cycle of violence and bloodshed with all eyes on Israel. Four giant Hercules transport planes, flying at greatly reduced speed, crept over the unseen waters of Lake Victoria in the heart of Africa. Operation Thunderbolt was on schedule. Suddenly, runway lights appeared ahead. The Entebbe airport in Uganda was brightly lit. They hadn't counted on this. Were they flying into a trap? David, piloting the leading Hercules, brought it down at such an angle that it seemed to fall out of the sky. It slipped almost noiselessly onto the runway at a speed carefully calculated to bring it within meters of the old terminal building where the hostages were held. The hostages had been passengers on Air France Flight 139 from Tel Aviv to Paris. At a scheduled stopover in Athens, a group of terrorists had boarded the plane along with the other new passengers. They hijacked the plane and forced it to land in Libya, where it was refueled before flying onto the Entebbe airport in Uganda. Additional terrorists joined the hijackers in Entebbe. The kidnappers demanded a ransom of $5 million for the release of the aeroplane and its passengers. They also demanded Israel release 40 convicted terrorists and 13 additional prisoners in four other countries. 
they gave the Israeli government a 48-hour deadline to comply or they would execute the hostages. With the deadline in motion and the seconds ticking away, the Israelis managed to get the deadline extended and decided to mount a rescue operation. They called it Operation Thunderbolt. Operation Thunderbolt was carefully planned and rehearsed. Every man on board the four transports knew exactly what he had to do. The men were out of the planes almost before they stopped, each man racing to his assigned target. It was deathly silent, but there was no trap. They had not been detected. The shooting inside the lounge lasted a minute and 45 seconds. All seven of the terrorists were killed. Two hostages were caught in the crossfire and one Israeli soldier lost his life. It all happened on the morning of July 4, 1976. The daring raid began at one minute after midnight. In just under an hour, the ground operation was completed and all four planes were in the air again. They were carrying more than 100 freed hostages, Israeli and French citizens, who had been scheduled to be executed by their captors that very morning, beginning at dawn. The sole Israeli military casualty of the daring raid was Yonatan Netanyahu. He was the leader of the rescue force. He was killed as he led the hostages toward the safety of the aircraft. The mission was later renamed Operation Jonathan in honor of Yonatan Netanyahu. He was the older brother of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, who is presently in charge of another hostage crisis. Operation Entebbe marked a dramatic victory over terrorism, but it didn't eliminate the danger. 47 years later, Israel continues to face terror and hostage taking. So what's the answer? Is there a way to stop this seemingly endless cycle of violence in the Middle East? Does the Bible shed any light on this matter? Does it suggest a solution? Right here, let me say this. There was a time when students of the Bible could talk freely about the Middle East, its history, and its relationship to Bible prophecy and prediction. And most people would listen with interest. But today, deep-seated loyalties on both sides of the conflict make any discussion of the situation in that area almost incendiary. You only have to look at the opposing rallies and protests being held around the world to recognize this. Social media platforms have become a propaganda battleground in the Israel-Gaza war. The discussion is filled with aggression, hatred, misinformation and propaganda. And yet every student of the Bible knows that the Middle East lies at the very heart of Bible history and prophecy. So it's not surprising that it's a storm center at the climax of Earth's history. What can we do? We have to talk about it. But every word has to be carefully chosen and every thought has to be expressed cautiously. People are easily offended, alienated or angered. So please know that it's not our purpose here to push an agenda or take sides in this conflict. I'm appalled and horrified by some of the events that have taken place. But I simply want to put the facts in perspective so that we can talk about their relation to the Bible, its history and its predictions. And today we happen to be talking about Israel because right now, all eyes are on Israel. Probably nowhere on the planet does a young person grow up and live out their life so close to the shadow of death as in Israel. All Israel is constantly in a state of alert. Men and women often have to drop the tools of their profession and join the army literally on the run. We are witnessing that right now as 
hundreds of thousands of Israeli army reservists are called to active duty. Since the day of her birth, itself in the midst of war, Israel has not been able to lay down the sword. It's been war after war, battle after battle. Surrounded on three sides by hostile forces, it seems that there's no peace or relief for Israel. Is it any wonder that her young men and women had developed both skill and courage that is difficult not to admire or at least respect? Operation Thunderbolt, combining as it did the elements of secrecy, speed and surprise, was a typical Israeli operation. Hopelessly outnumbered by her enemies, she is convinced that it's the only way she can defend herself. And that's why her army and air force have become experts at night fighting, experts at surprise, experts at doing the unexpected. It was Solomon who said, wisdom prevails over strength, knowledge over brute force, for wars are won by skillful strategy. And that's what the Israelis have been doing, producing a master ruse from the days of Gideon until now. And miraculously, they seem to have survived against all the odds. And now Israel is at war again, forced to defend herself. But this is a different kind of war. On the 7th of October, the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas launched an unprecedented land, sea and air assault on Israel. Thousands of rockets were fired. Their gunmen crossed the border and attacked settlements, a peaceful music festival, villages and cities. They literally went from home to home, door to door, specifically targeting civilians, any civilians, babies, the elderly, women and children. No one was spared. It was the single worst massacre of Jews since the Nazi Holocaust in World War II. More than 1,400 Israelis were killed in a single day. And over 200, including infants and elderly, were taken captive and removed to Gaza as hostages. In response, the Israeli military carried out thousands of air and artillery strikes on Hamas targets in Gaza. Thousands of Palestinians have been killed, including women and children. Hospitals and morgues are filled to overflowing. When you consider the violence and hatred that's filling Israel and Gaza now, you can't help wondering if peace is even realistic in Israel. Jews and Muslims both have emotional attachments to this same stretch of land. So how did the situation develop in modern times? Well, let's take a look at the roots of the issue. Britain took control of the area known as Palestine following the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. The land was inhabited by Jews and Arabs, as well as other smaller ethnic groups. Tensions between the Jews and Arabs grew when the international community gave Britain the task of establishing a national homeland in Palestine for Jewish people. To Jews, Palestine was their ancestral homeland and had been for over 3,000 years. But Palestinian Arabs also claimed the land and opposed the move. Between the 1920s and 40s, the number of Jews arriving there grew, with many fleeing from persecution in Europe, especially the Nazi Holocaust in World War II. In 1947, the UN voted for Palestine to be split into separate Jewish and Arab states. That plan was accepted by Jewish leaders but rejected by the Arab side and so was never implemented. And then in 1948, unable to solve the problem, Britain withdrew and Jewish leaders declared the creation of the State of Israel. It was intended to be a safe haven for Jews fleeing persecution, as well as a national homeland for Jews. Fighting between Jewish and Arab militias 
had been intensifying for months. And the day after Israel declared statehood, five Arab countries attacked. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians fled or were forced out of their homes in what they call Al-Nakba, or the catastrophe. By the time the fighting ended in a ceasefire the following year, Israel controlled most of the territory. But because there was never a peace agreement, there were more wars and fighting in the following decades. In a war in 1967, Israel occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank, as well as most of the Syrian Golan Heights, Gaza, and the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. This resulted in many Palestinian refugees. Most Palestinian refugees and their descendants live in Gaza and the West Bank, as well as in neighboring countries, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Neither they nor their descendants have been allowed by Israel to return to their homes. Israel says this would overwhelm the country and threaten its existence as a Jewish state. Israel still occupies the West Bank and claims the whole of Jerusalem as its eternal capital, while the Palestinians claim East Jerusalem as the capital of a hoped for future Palestinian state. The US is one of only a handful of countries to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. In the past 50 years, Israel has built settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, where more than 700,000 Jews now live. Gaza is a narrow strip of land sandwiched between Israel and the Mediterranean Sea, but with a short southern border with Egypt. Just 41 kilometers or 25 miles long and 10 kilometers wide, it is more than 2 million inhabitants and is one of the most densely populated places on Earth. Now, Gaza is ruled by Hamas, a militant Islamist group which is committed to the destruction of Israel and is designated as a terrorist group by most Western countries. Hamas won the Palestinians' last elections in 2006 and seized control of Gaza the following year by ousting the rival Fatah movement of West Bank-based President Mahmoud Abbas. Since then, militants in Gaza have fought several wars with Israel, which, along with Egypt, has maintained a partial blockade of the Strip to isolate Hamas and try to stop attacks, particularly the indiscriminate firing of rockets towards Israeli cities. As Israel and Palestinians launch yet another war, the question needs to be asked, are Israelis and Palestinians locked forever in a dreadful cycle of violence, with thousands of families on both sides forever grieving their lost children, parents or siblings? Is peace even realistic in Israel? Many people today are asking, well, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible shed any light on this matter? Does it suggest a solution? Well, according to Bible history, what we are seeing in the Middle East today is the longest family feud in history. It's a battle between the descendants of two half-brothers through Abraham. Ishmael and Isaac were sons of Abraham from different mothers. The Arabs traced their heritage through Ishmael back to Abraham. The Jews traced their heritage back to Abraham through Isaac. Now, Isaac had a son called Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons from whom the Jews come. The descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, the Jews and the Arabs, are still fighting over the inheritance from Abraham today. They are vying for the same land. That's what they're fighting over. Now, God chose the Jews to be his special representatives in this world. He made many wonderful promises to Israel that were conditional on her obedience and loyalty to God. When Jesus came, the promises were expanded to include all those 
who accept Jesus as the Messiah. The Bible says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Access to the special blessings of God and to the promises made to Abraham no longer depend on being a literal Jew. Rather, it depends on acceptance of Jesus by Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, or whatever your nationality. Jews are now able to receive a double blessing. In a sense, they were chosen twice, first through their Jewish heritage and second through their discovery and acceptance of the Messiah. Through the centuries and in this present day, God has had and does have a special love for the Jews. So the question remains, how do we deal with this situation that is exploding in Israel and Gaza today? And as passions become inflamed here in our own country, in our own neighbourhood, how should we respond? Well, regardless of what side you come down on in this conflict, as followers of Christ, we are called to be beacons of love in the face of fear, beacons of peace in the face of conflict, beacons of neighbourly kindness in the face of demonization and division. May we do all we can in the days ahead to love and support our Jewish and Muslim neighbours as we pray for a swift end to this horrendous war. And remember, Jesus called Jerusalem a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord's house is meant to be a safe place, a place where joy and prayer grow freely. All the facets of the phrase house of prayer are important to our Lord, and they ought to be important to us as well. When we consider the house of the Lord, when we consider Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem, we ought to guard these matters. We ought to make sure we don't bring selfishness, racism, disunity, or any other thing that would hinder a spirit of a sweet, joyful prayer to the gathering of God's people. May we cherish the Lord's joy and presence when we gather together or discuss these matters with others. So, let's pray for Jerusalem. In Psalm 122, the Bible calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and that has never been more important. Now, while some use it explicitly in support of Israel, Others have noted the modern-day city is full of Jews, Christians, Muslims, Israelis, Palestinians, and countless other nationalities. And so lifting up this melting pot of a city and praying for peace within its walls is also a prayer for unity and harmony between every community. The only real lasting solution to the violence and war in Israel is the return of the Prince of Peace. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, his first visitors were the Jewish shepherds. And then came the wise men from the East, the Arab princes. I like to think that when Jesus returns, it will be that way again. I like to think that in the great crowd waiting to welcome him, there will be Jewish shepherds and farmers and one-time fighters and wise men from the Arab world, and all the rest of us, including you and me. And here's some real good news. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He can bring peace to troubled cities, to troubled nations, and also to troubled hearts. When you make room for Jesus, He gives you one of the greatest gifts. Here's what He says. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. The peace that comes from the world is totally circumstantial. If you have a good job, then you're at peace. But if you lose your job, then you're not at peace anymore. If you've got money in the bank, then you're at peace. 
But when that money is gone, then you're not at peace anymore. Jesus gives you a different kind of peace. The Bible calls it peace, which surpasses all understanding. And what does that mean? Well, it means you have peace when there's no obvious or visible reason why you should be at peace. Everything around you could be in chaos, but for some unexplained reason, you're at peace. Well, that's the peace that surpasses understanding. And it can only come from Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Jesus wants to give you that kind of peace so that you won't be troubled or afraid. If you would like to find out more about how you can experience this heavenly peace, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for you today. It's the booklet, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive your free gift today. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 770 800 266 in the United States or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at the addresses on your screen or email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. Be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray to the God who can bring peace to our hearts and peace to the Middle East. Dear Heavenly Father, our world is witnessing war again in the Holy Land. Once more, all eyes are on Israel. We pray for Jerusalem. We pray with the relatives of the victims, and we pray for all those who are experiencing hours of terror and anguish. We pray for the peoples of the region and pray for peace. In particular, we pray for the safety of all civilians, whether residents or tourists and pilgrims. And we pray for a cessation of violence and the release of all hostages. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.